a public meeting at an enclosed public place under the Emergency Management Act 2004, Emergency Management Direction 2021. As such, all persons, including elected members, staff, visitors and the gallery must not enter or remain within this meeting place unless they are wearing a face mask. Additionally, all persons must use scan in via the QR code prior to entering or provide their name and contact detail on the sheet provided. So welcome once again, our staff uh, and, and elected members. We'll begin our meeting tonight with an acknowledgement of country. We would like to acknowledge and Nadjuri people, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are present today, the oldest continuing living race on earth. Uh, apologies and leave of absence. Do we have any apologies for tonight's meeting? I've received no apologies. If not, I welcome uh, all those online too tonight, including Councillor Simon Zeller. Good evening, Simon, and good evening, Councillor Mitchell. And uh, Richard, good evening again. Uh, the confirmation of our minutes of the meeting held the 23rd of November 2021. Would someone like to move that they be a true and correct record of that meeting? Thanks, Councillor Bill. Would someone like to second that? Councillor Jason, all those in favour? Motions carried. We move on to section five, our communications. Um, Mayor's communications has been a busy period and uh, often is around this time of year, of course, for everybody. Uh, one of the highlights, and that, that's something that I really treasure the opportunity, was the Kapunda High School student presentation evening uh, last uh, Monday night uh, to present the mayoral awards. To, to Tanya Dabrowski and Owen Matz, uh, this year's uh, ducks of the, uh, from the high school. Uh, it's an amazing school and I'd probably blow their bags every every time I get the opportunity, but the, the outcomes from there are just amazing and, and their new uh, buildings are almost uh, ready to be uh, used and certainly by uh, the start of the next school year will be. I think they've spent something like $15 million on extensions so the school is certainly there to stay. It was a, a very impressive night and their guest speaker was uh, a young lady uh, who had graduated from that school some time ago and uh, she knew me better than I knew her, but uh, she was the first person who interviewed me when she was a cadet at the Bunyip newspaper in Gawler quite some years ago and it was quite a reunion. Um, she's. Uh, kicked on pretty much since that time. She's now a, a presenter in the Riverland. She's got her own show, etc., and uh, is doing very well for herself. Just another example of uh, what's coming out of that school. Uh, also, the uh, a valedictory ceremony at the Adelaide University. I'm not sure if I mentioned this at the last meeting or not because it happened around about that time. But uh, the, the animal and veterinary science uh, campus at, uh, at, at the Roseworthy campus is quite extraordinary. Uh, it's probably one of only three in Australia and something like 700 students involved. It's an amazing place and uh, I think this year they had something like uh, 70 graduating vets. That, that's fab fabulous and that's happening in, in our council region. We've got a very strong relationship with the university and obviously in the future we'll be looking to do um, many more uh, things in partnership. Professor Wayne Hine is the Dean of the University over there and he has a strong relationship with our council and, uh, and, uh, and I uh, have a strong uh, personal relationship with, uh, with Wayne as well. Uh, one of the other uh, interesting uh, engagements was the opening of the Brosta Enterprise uh, Centre's new activity centre. Uh, probably 1.5 million they spent on that. A lot of that money was uh, donated through uh, uh, benefactors, etc. The Minister, Michelle Lemsick, was present to do the official opening. Uh, it's an amazing place and uh, I can remember when the Brosser Enterprises uh, began in the early days when they were just in a, a little shed in Bazardo Road in Tanunda. 
And they've come a long way since then, and they're uh, really doing a lot of work with people with uh, disabilities, etc. To the point, I, I'd like to think that our council could consider looking at some of their uh, some of their uh, um, clients there to uh, do some work experience with our council. I think it would be a, a wonderful opportunity for us to engage. Uh, Brosser Enterprises is on that side of Samuel Road, by the way. They're actually in the Brosser Council area, but they regard themselves as, as a, a light regional council identity, so we're pretty happy with that, hence the invitation. Um, the other uh, message, again, I was invited to do the uh, one of the lessons and the nine lessons and carols at the combined church services here. So it was a bit nervous for me because I'm not uh, familiar with uh, the big book, but uh, it's, a, it's a great experience and, uh, and it's great to see those traditions still taking place in our, in our towns. And, uh, you know, it's uh, something that's been going for many years now and obviously by the number of people that were present that night will continue. Also last Friday we had the Regardless Board meeting at uh, Kadena which was a, an interesting affair. And I can report that uh, Simon uh, Milcox, who, uh, who presented our last council meeting, has been re-engaged for a further two-year extension to his contract. And it was a very, very good decision, I thought. He's doing some excellent work. That's probably enough from me. Uh, media was quite busy too with a number of discussions that we had there about various matters, um, which is good that we're staying involved and. Uh, and uh, we're not making the front page for the wrong reasons. Council, is there any uh, council reports that you'd uh, like to, to speak on? Uh, if not, we'll move on. We don't have any uh, documents or correspondence table this evening, but we do have a, uh, uh, section seven, we do have a presentation tonight from uh, Dan Hill. And welcome, Dan, uh, in relation to a, a music festival that's uh, uh, about to take place in the, in the Greenock region, aimed at uh, young people in our region, which uh, I think is fantastic. You know, it's, it's great to see uh, uh, young people being mentioned in our council chamber and things happening for them. And uh, hopefully our council can uh, get behind uh, this particular uh, event. So I welcome you, uh, uh, Dan, if you'd like to, to take the lectern and uh, let us know what uh, we can you have in store for us. to be able to um, to go out and, uh, and experience a lot of cultural activities like live music and, and have a passion for it. And I think that's something that is lacking here, uh, especially out in regional areas. So um, we had been working on this prior to the, the pandemic, um, which then obviously everything kind of had breaks put on with, uh, with COVID. Uh, and we sort of wait, watched and waited and then uh, Earlier in this year, uh, we had an opportunity to kind of bring it back um, to the table. We had planned to launch this event in July as part of the uh, Umbrella Music Festival uh, with Music SA. So um, Music SA uh, have provided us with some funding to launch a regional event as part of their Umbrella Festival program, uh, which was a winter festival program. And that was due to set place in the middle of the seven day circuit breaker um, lockdown we had. So obviously it didn't go ahead. Um, once things kind of 
uh, resolved back to a, a relative normality. We started really looking at how would we do this, and um, as vaccination rates rose uh, and the promise of kind of returning to some form of uh, normality when it comes to live music and recreation, we sort of thought, well, let's have a look at rescheduling a date, and hence looking at summer where it's a bit nicer. The original event uh, had sold out within 10 days with the uh, uh, indoor capacity under the current under the restrictions at the time, which was 100 people. Um, the new dates allowing us for up to 300. So we've um, extended that by creating an, an outdoor stage uh, and yeah, allowing for more uh, more people to get involved um, within the event. So currently we have nine bands booked from both region, uh, suburbs and, and metro across South Australia, um, ranging from kind of larger acts with a bit of popularity to sort of small and lesser known bands, um, all generally in that kind of rock and punk sort of aesthetic, so things that are generally a little bit more louder, a bit more sort of distorted and um, not, not the sort of stuff you normally hear in the, uh, the local pubs and, and wine bars around the region. So something that really uh, shakes up and, and creates a point of difference. So, um, yeah, so that's what we're doing um, and why. And the why was, yeah, really just trying to engage, uh, engage that demographic, create some new opportunities. And also we kind of discovered that as the COVID has um, made international travel a lot more difficult, we also feel there's a huge opportunity within, uh, within the country to see a return to regional form. So, Whereas in the past, a lot of artists would record an album, go on a touring cycle, that generally met uh, capital cities, and then they would jet off overseas and do their, their touring cycle overseas. Um, that's going to become more and more difficult, and so those small to medium artists are more likely to, to find a, a source of revenue by actually going out to the region. And by doing this, we hope to see that maybe light region can be seen as an attractive place to do some regional touring and create some uh, attractive opportunities for people to come out, play music, and also inspire local youth and constituents to actually want to play music or, or go to live events or put on their own festivals. Um, so that was, yeah, the why. Um, and what I was hoping to kind of present to you tonight is uh, we funded this through, through Music SA, for ticket sales. Um, both myself and, and my colleagues have been working on this come from marketing backgrounds so and we've put away effort into uh, developing the program to planning to um, promoting and marketing it um, and now we have realized recognized a slight shortfall in our funding um, with a couple of uh, what we think are very important parts that we'd like to see if we can get some financial assistance with. Uh, one of those key uh, criteria was ensuring accessibility. So the venue, uh, the Grenoch, the, the pub have quite kindly offered their venue um, in kind to allow us to, to utilise their space, um, but they don't have uh, disabled access to all the facilities. So one thing for us that was very key about offering this program was ensuring that everyone was welcome, doesn't matter age, gender, um, and if you do have uh, special needs of any sort, that it was accessible. And so for us, that's a very key part of it, is ensuring that nobody's left behind or left out. Um, and the other part is ensuring that um, if someone's coming into the region or all are from the region, and this event goes, when this event goes ahead, we want them to make sure that they have the best time possible, which means reducing line, uh, reducing waiting times at lines, ensuring people can get in and out, ensuring that no unruly behaviour happens. So we want to ensure that we have extra security than the, uh, than the venue is providing, just to make sure that we'd rather have overkill in that regard than to um, have too little and then find out that we have problems. So, I mean, we really want to see this as something that people walk away from and remember for, for years to come and talk about that time that there was that amazing music event in, in Grenock. Um, and then hopefully that can evolve and we can create a sustainable model out of it that uh, becomes part of light region. So we think it doesn't necessarily need to be ground off, it could be the pun, it could be freeling. Um, but yeah, trying to find something that um, allows music to, to happen in, in the region uh, and something that is accessible, something that is exciting, something that's new. 
Thank you, Dan. Councillors, are there any questions? Um, I don't. Have you got a COVID plan for this for the 300 people? So, yes, I've just spoken to the venue and the Cumberlake here. Uh, so, they, under their license, they've just got an extended license and COVID plan will do. So, you don't have to have a COVID uh, plan for the hotel? So, the, it'll be under the hotel's COVID plan and that's been approved. So, they don't need, because it's under 1,000 people, they don't need to have a, um, what's the word? A, they don't need a COVID management plan, they just have their COVID safety plan. Oh, right, so you're allowed to have 300 people in, inside the Greenock Hotel. Uh, so we'll be out in the beer garden and in the back garden. And that's allowed to have the 300 people across the venue. I was a bit worried about it because I thought uh, uh, you didn't mention it in your presentation at all. Uh, and I thought, well, uh, everybody else has to have a COVID plan. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I just wondered where, where you were at with that. And the age groups that will be there, um, it'll be all ages, will it? Yes, yeah. So we've seen ticket sales from everyone from, I think it was Lois, I've seen a ticket sale from eight years of age, mm -hmm. up to 63. So we've seen a very broad range of people purchase tickets here. So it's a licensed venue, so the young eight-year-olds will be all right there? They'll be fine. Uh, security will provide with wristbands for um, people over the age of 18 to be able to purchase alcoholic beverages. Um, the one thing we've also been very uh, strong on through this promotion, uh, through this uh, event, was moving away from um, creating something that like we knew we could have gone to a lot of local um, alcohol producers for sponsorship. Um, but we wanted to move away from that. We feel a lot of the, the events that happen around the region uh, generally have sort of alcohol at the forefront and then sort of food, music and stuff is kind of an afterthought, whereas with the others, this is all about ensuring that music is what people are there for um, and then there is food and beverage and as part of that. You know, the, uh, the, uh, I have another question, if that's all right. Mm. Um, uh, so there will be dancing. Uh, that's still to be confirmed, so we're still at the mercy of the government's um, COVID regulations. At the moment, no. At the moment, being outdoors, people can stand, so they're wearing a mask unless they're consuming food or, or beverage. Um, but we are hoping that we will see dancing become available. Um, I believe the Premier announced, or Darren Grant Stevens announced today, that by the end of the week, they're hoping to have the, uh, the plan in place for what that's going to look like come to the end of the year when we hit that 90 percent vaccination rate. And and if I might just ask, I'm sorry, but I've read this thoroughly and I want to know uh, if um, have you will you be having social distancing? Yes. So as part of that, uh, and whatever the regulations are as part of the COVID management plan will be out on the field. So, so you'll have a marshal there seeing that everybody is within a metre and a half or two metres apart? Yes. Yeah, so there'll be a COVID marshal there, and well, there'll be actually be multiple um, on registered as COVID marshals. My colleague Kieran is, and the Greenock Hotel themselves have uh, multiple COVID marshals, and we've already discussed around this and whatever the regulations are required as part of that COVID safe plan. Um, but we'll be ensuring that everybody adheres to it. Oh well, I hope it goes all right. Then, if that's what you want, but uh, I just I'm concerned about. Uh, the social distancing for a start mm -hmm. uh, because um, uh, if you think that that won't be social distancing won't be in in January so do you think that won't be in no no I think social distancing will still play a part I still believe masks will be a part uh, I mean once again I'm not not in charge of what the rules are in place we will be living with COVID for a very long time so the best we can do is ensure that we're abiding by what uh, SA Health and the Premier and then the government recommend we do um, and try and still bring some uh, some light and some fun and some recreation. To yeah, I, I understand that. But no, that's all right. I yeah. hope it goes all right. No, thank you. Thanks, Councillor. And Councillor Bill. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Dan, this sounds fantastic. Uh, the Mayor and I both like loud music. So <laughs> we'll, we'll be there, won't we? Won't we? Um, just, 
just I'm not quite sure. Are you doing this under SA Music or is this in, you two doing it as individuals or how, how's it running? Individuals. Uh, basically, we I, I literally I live in Grenoble. I'm pretty passionate about my community and wanting to do things that uh, I suppose, for lack of a better term, disrupt. Um, my background's in, in, in marketing and communications, so I like the, I, I'm a big believer in uh, in not following the part of the status quo, trying to do things a little bit differently. And um, I feel like there's a lot of doing the same thing, especially when it comes to events. Uh, and like I said, for me, I do find that alcohol generally is a, a big part of a lot of the events that you see around the region. Um, as someone whose wife doesn't drink and I have a young child, um, I like to drink myself, but it doesn't need to be the forefront of what we do. And I think trying to create, change that culture, create opportunities for people like that um, is important. Um, I'm also a big believer that if you want to see change, you've got to drive it yourself. So um, it's all well and good me saying, oh, it would be good to do something like this, or I wish someone would do something like this, but really the only way to do it is to get out there and do it yourself. So literally as a, myself as a private citizen and my public Kieran, um, we, I've been, I had been working in in the um, in the region. I previously had worked for Secretary Dog Stillers uh, on uh, in Maranga there, um, but I currently don't work in that uh, work there anymore. But um, we're looking at yeah, how do we kind of um, create something interesting, create an economic driver for the region, but also just kind of create that engagement. So yeah, we just sort of went and saw it, and it's been a fun little. Uh, not little, it's very fun, quite big, but it's been a fun project to work on outside of our, our work hours. And um, yeah, at the moment, it really seems to be grabbing some legs to keep involved. Um, just saw this afternoon, Glam Adelaide's posted an article about it. Um, got notification from News Corp today that they're likely to run a story on it in the Sunday Mail. Um, so we're starting to get a bit of legs, people are hearing about it, and um, hopefully, yeah, puts us on the map a little bit. Go on, you can Thank, thank you, Dan. That's uh, great to see an event in, in a progressive little town like Grenock too, such as this, and it's not alcohol focused as well. I think it's very refreshing to know that. Uh, councillors, uh, within the, uh, the the report here, there is a um, a request for a contribution. Uh, I'd like uh, councillors to consider that, and uh, I'll open that for discussion around the table. There's a request for uh, four hundred dollars to. So I did actually realise as well, my colleague Kieran put $400 on there. We were actually, what he should have put on there would be $100. So what we were hoping was, so the toilets themselves, their special needs toilets be about $400. And then we were hoping to see if we could get some more funding um, up upwards to an extra $1,000 to cover for some extra security. Yeah, so... Uh... Are you asking us to change this resolution here? Or if, that's, if that's possible. Well, anything's possible. With, uh, whether, <laughs> whether the council members would agree to, to that uh, increase is another matter. That might be modified somewhat, but uh, that's up to the elected councillors to consider that. But I thought $400 did seem a little bit low. <laughs> yes, I, um, I know I've got to mention that because when I spoke to Kieran originally, he was going to come along and said, oh, I can't make it, can you go? So I said, oh, sure, that's fine. And he so, said, so, but what was in the reputation? And, uh, and then he said, $400. And I said, what? <laughs> Councillors, I'll open up for discussion uh, anyway. This is Councillor Dean. Uh, thanks, Mayor Bill. Um, our, obviously, with this on January the 8th, we need to make a decision tonight if we're going to provide any funding. We need to be aware of the um, guidelines for motions without notice. That's the only way we can do it. And generally, uh, they don't encourage us to make money talk decisions. Uh, that there is a thing in there about um, matters arising from agenda items, which this does. So I'm. I think we could stretch a point and and move a a motion for a small amount. Not sure whether we could stretch to 1400 without stretching that guideline a little bit. Mm. So uh, I'd be personally in favour of providing some funding, but probably not the full 1400. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Any other comments, Councillor? Um, 
if uh, if they would have gone through, uh, if you've known about it for such a long time, and you would have gone through uh, our grant funding uh, through our community services, um, that would have that would have covered the whole thing because you would have got the thousand dollars through the grant funding. But it's too late to do that now because our our budgets are set. And uh, I agree with Dean. Uh, I think uh, you know if, if you can give four hundred dollars or three hundred and sixty, that's fine. But I, I wouldn't be in favour of uh, taking another thousand out because I don't know where that thousand would come from in our budget. I just asked Lorinda if you have any comment in relation to this. Lorinda, do you have a budget surplus in your uh, in your charge at this stage? Yeah, thank you, Lorinda. I think we've covered the matter pretty much. And uh, you know, I regret to say, Dan, we've we've got a problem on our hands just here in this presentation and this request, uh, based on what Lorinda has said. Uh, I think you can feel the the atmosphere in the room suggests that we probably would like to support this, but maybe we we need to see this re redrafted, uh, taking into account what uh, Lorinda said in terms of the incorporated body being the auspicing uh, um, body to request the funds. And, and maybe uh, something like that could could work. But I'm, I'm mindful of the date. The 8th of January is, uh, makes that a bit difficult as well. Uh, Councillor, is there any other comments? Uh, Councillor Bill? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I, I was quite happy to support the $400. And, and uh, and provided, I would support $700, provided it can work through Lorinda's system, give to the, to the tavern. I think it's a, it's a new idea. It's, a, it's supporting young people, which is what we've been trying to do in the in, the, in our tourism bit, the program. I think it's great to give some young fellows some support. So I'd fully support $700. I, I was, you know, $400 I was very comfortable with, but it provided Lorinda can work through the incorporated body through the tavern. And, yeah. And fulfills all the other requirements of the 
yep. in our general, like providing details of financials at the end of it. So I'd be quite happy to move that way. Thanks so much, Councillor Bill. Mr Councilor. Mayor, um, I would like to ask Lorinda, when she spoke about public liability and all those other things that mm. have to be done before we can give money out of Lorinda's budget, mm. if that's where it's coming from, we need to... Uh, what's she do? People on line can't hear. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I'm just, I, I'm concerned uh, about where the money is coming from, and, but apart from that $700 or $400 or whatever it is, is the public liability all in place and do we have that documentation, Lorinda? I haven't received any documentation as yet. Um, I received a phone inquiry last Monday, the 6th of December, um, inquiring and because of the processing and because this was the last chance for a council to approach the elected body prior to the event, um, the only way to do it was doing the, the deputation. In terms of the budget, we could repurpose some of the Christmas funding. Would be possible to do that because the Kapunda event didn't go ahead. So well, that's something for the elected body to consider. So on, on the basis that uh, the funding could be made available uh, and if the conditions of the grant funding were met, uh, which includes the public liability, et cetera, uh, this application would receive a favourable response. There would be sufficient funding in the Christmas-specific events yep. budget to be for, for the $700, like uh, Councillor Bill is suggesting, which is half of what... Uh, it's a compromise between what's there, what you require, and half of that. So something would definitely be better than nothing. Absolutely. The event is successful. Councillor Dean? Um, yeah, Bill, uh, I'd be happy to second um, Bill's motion subject to the conditions that uh, Lorinda has outlined being met. Thank you, Councillor Dean. Are there any questions or further comments, Councillors? Councillor Jason? Um, I was going to second, but obviously Dean's done that. Um, I will also personally um, provide some funding for you. Um, through my business, um, I think it's a great cause, and I think if I can help top it up, I'll I'll do that. All right, thanks so much. Oh, thanks, Councillor Jason. That's a that's a wonderful uh, contribution. That's terrific. Thank you, uh, Councillors. We've got a motion uh, that's subject to meeting the uh, conditions of the of the, grant, of the, the funding uh, that we provide seven hundred dollars toward the choir festival in Greenock. Uh, we'll have a mover and a seconder. If there are no further comments or questions, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? That's carried. Thank you, councillors. And, and thank you, Dan, for, for, uh, for being here and uh, explaining that. It's uh, obviously a very well organised event. I appreciate what uh, Councillor Lynn has uh, raised in terms of COVID, etc. We need to be assured that we're supporting events that have got all those things in place. Obviously, you have. Um, we, we love seeing things happen in uh, Greenock. It's a, it's a great community and it's a place where things are really happening on the move and this fits in beautifully with our, our youth focus too, which we're trying desperately as a council to engage with our younger people better than we have. It's not so, not so lack of trying, but uh, we want to do better. So this is another opportunity for us to do that. So thank you for, for, for coming on tonight and presenting and we wish you all the best with the Quiet Festival. Thank you. And thank you, Jason. Just before we move on, uh, councillors, uh, you must keep your cameras on if you're online. We might have had some issue with that. Councillors, moving on. Uh, 
We have no adjourned business, but we head to a business arising. Uh, first matter, 24th of September, 2019. 27th of January, 21. 23rd of March, 21. 27th of July, 21. 24th of August, 21. I'd just like to make uh, one comment at this particular stage. Um, I, I think I'd like to make it public knowledge uh, that I will be standing uh, in the next election uh, as your mayor. And uh, I'd make that public so that if people are out there and they have uh, any thoughts of uh, uh, standing, they know they've got uh, some competition. But I would encourage that because I think uh, competition is good. But uh, I'm standing and I would really encourage all of you as elected members to stand. I've, I've been you know, so pleased to, to work with this council over the last four years. I think it's the, the best council I've worked with in the three and uh, I'd like it to continue. So uh, I'll make my, my stand uh, public and I guess in time everyone around the table will, will do the same thing. But I would certainly encourage you to put your hand up, bearing in mind we are losing uh, one councillor and we will only have the three wards, of course. So we've got a, a bit of a sea change of how we'll, uh, uh, this election will look. But uh, I can see it being a very positive sort of uh, um, election coming up. So thank you for that. Any comments or questions in relation to that? If not, we'll move on to the 31st of August 21, the 28th of September 21. Uh, we move on to the 26th of October, 21. Uh, there's a matter there of a pedestrian crossing. We've had some discussions about that, and this will be raised once again at the, uh, the next infrastructure meeting, but I've been assured by, uh, by Richard Dodson that uh, this, uh, the issues surrounding that haven't gone unnoticed and they've been reported to, to the uh, Department of, uh, of Transport uh, for their uh, attention. Uh, We've talked about perhaps having a couple of little signs put either side of the crossing, notifying uh, pedestrians of their responsibility also to, to uh, look before they, they cross. And, and uh, it sounds pretty much like the line marking is going to take place um, uh, uh, from uh, our own resources. Make sure it gets done. Councillor Jason? Um, just to follow up with that, um, I've um, been in liaison with uh, the local police as well. I actually had a conversation with them about this and um, obviously try and get a bit of police presence after the conversation we had a little while ago. Um, as they've said, the, the biggest issue is obviously if they park anywhere nearby, everyone's going to slow down. It's, it's a bit like when they drive through in unmarked cars, they see everyone on their mobile phone in a marked car. They don't see anyone. It's the same sort of principle. <laughs> um, there has been ongoing Obviously, we, we see it having a business right next to that pedestrian crossing, the optometrist next door. They were having a, a street meeting about it the other day. So it's definitely an ongoing thing, and I think it's something we definitely need to follow up. Yes, sorry. To totally agree with you, Councillor Jason. And uh, I said, Councillor David's nodding his head, and I think anyone that uh, lives in this town would be aware that there is a problem there, and we do need to fix it. And there are some uh, methods that we can undertake in the future but they might be uh, rather large budget items as well. So they'll probably come up in a business case towards a, um, budget time. So I uh, thank you for that. On the 23rd of November, 21. And then we move on to section 10, minutes from committee meetings. Uh, there was no committee meetings held in the last couple of weeks, so there's nothing to report there. Uh, the next matter is uh, 10.5, the governance advisory panel, which did meet. Recommendation one, that the gender reports and minutes of the meeting of the Light Regional Council Governance Advisory Panel held Tuesday the 7th of December be received. Does someone like to move that way? Councillor Dean, someone like to second that? Councillor Bill, all those in favour? Those against, that's carried. There is one matter there, councillors. We Oh, Councillor Simon, sorry. You have a question? Oh, yeah, I just have a question to um, to that matter, if that's possible. So 
we haven't moved the, the recommendation yet, have we? No. Okay, so then, then I'll probably, um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a few questions about this matter, if that's possible. Is that the time to do that now? About this, this specific matter? Yes. Yeah, we've put the recommendation one. I need a, a moving or a second for that, of course, which I've done. Okay. Oh, okay. All those in favour? Those against? Okay. The recommendation two is that the reports and recommendations of the meeting of Light Region Advisory Panel numbered one by list to be adopted. But before we do that, uh, I'll have a question from Councillor Simon. Councillor Simon. Thank you. Th through the Mayor. Um, I was I was wondering. Um, yeah, I've looked through the the, the GEP, uh, GAP agenda, and it only appears in the minutes on the other business. So I, I don't really understand how this thing actually arose and what what the point of it is. So if, if somebody could explain that to me a bit closer, that would be great. Yeah, I might have to refer to our CEO to explain this. It's, a, it's an interesting matter. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the, background, the background to this was that the Higginbotham group um, indicated that they were going to hold a luncheon um, in favour of the Development Act uh, Roseworthy and invited a number of guests and included in that guest list um, the elected members of council and members of staff. The matter was referred to the Office of Public Integrity and they wrote a letter to council indicating that they had serious concerns about elected members and members of staff attending. Um, based on the view that we've had dealings with Higginbotham in the past and potentially dealings with Higginbotham in the future. Um, they referred to their policy um, and recent publication around identify, disclose and manage conflicts of interest in public administration. And they particularly made reference to decisions related to land use and rezoning. And in their publication, they indicate that decision makers in these areas ought to be careful about potential conflicts of interest, either real or perceived. The difficulty we had as management, although we took this advice and accepted it, is that the decision makers in land use and rezoning are not the elected members of council. They are, in fact, the independent members of the council assessment panel. And with respect to rezoning, uh, it's the minister of planning. Having said that, we accepted um, the view of um, OPI and inform the elected members that, based on that advice, it's probably wise not to attend. However, um, we've raised it with the gap because it does throw up a new approach with the new um, ICAT commissioner. The former ICAT commissioner didn't have any problems with people in public life attending such functions. So there's been a different view. And we indicated to the governance advisory panel that there needs to be a code of business practice um, because in doing business, there's always relationships and we adopt the view that, that there needs to be relationships with integrity. So we're now asking the gap, um, how do we move forward with a code of business practice when we've got that particular letter um, in our, um, in our organisation and they they take a view that we should get some separate advice um, on that letter and then they'll make a, a view on how we can progress with the code of business practice and ensuring that we can have relationships with integrity in dealing with business. 
So that's the that's the background to it, um, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Brian. Uh, are you satisfied with that, Councillor Zaba? Did you did you understand what was presented there? Um, yes, yes, to the chair. Yes, that's um, that that sounds so good. I was just wondering because we do have um, you know, code of conduct uh, policies, and we, we do have um, you know, we follow obviously the the, the um, local government act, and there is conflict of interest and all this sort of stuff is in there. I just wondered if this. If this is something separate, but the way you explained it, that makes very much sense. It's a specific incident that leads to this specific case that we now need to solve. Yeah, I think the local government association too probably need to, to do some driving in this particular area as well, because we wouldn't be the only council that have been affected by uh, this, this decision. So we'll, we'll wait uh, and see what the, the local government association have got to say. All right, councillors, we... Uh, have a, a recommendation at the top there that, that the reports and recommendations of many a light regional council advisory panel as this will be adopted. However, we've got to, well, there is only the one. Recommendation two. That's recommendation two. We'll have a mover and a second for that, please, councillors. Councillor Lynn and Councillor Jason, all those in favour? Those against, that's carried. Now, there's a third recommendation down the bottom of the page. I hope someone moved that way. Councillor Dean and Councillor Jason, all those in favour? To, to recommendation three. Yes, I have a <clears throat> I have a an amendment to that recommendation three and I have it here in hard copy. I can pass it up. Mm -hmm. Recommendation amendment that the matter be conducted in open council instead of a confidential mode. The necessity of confidential is unwarranted. There is no suppression of elected members' identity. The aspect of training of all elected council members should be disclosed. The withholding of disclosures of gaps 1201 is recommended to be kept confidential on the matter is finalised. The matter will be finalised at this meeting. Some time ago, the SA Ombudsman conducted an audit to excessive use of confidentiality by councils. Lately, LRC many agendas have contained an increased number of confidential items. Uh, thank you, Councillor Peter. I I must uh, agree with you uh, in, in, in uh, perhaps your reasons here. I think it's reasonable and fair. Um, I would like to note, though, that the reason we put that in the confidentiality, uh, in the confidence, was to protect the, the integrity of the person involved. And that was the simple reason. The other matters that you, you, you raise here are relevant. There's no doubt about that. But I think the... Uh, uh, the uh, integrity of the person involved uh, uh, is a matter for a confidential section. Now, I'm, I'm open for discussion in relation to that, Councillor Dean. Um, um, in terms of meeting procedure, that motion, that recommendation has now been moved to second, so it's actually a motion. What is being proposed is, in fact, a negative of that motion, so it's not allowable. A. The amendment, um, amendment to a motion is a slight modification of the motion. It cannot be negative to the motion. Uh, had that been uh, raised before the recommendation was moved, so it became a motion, then what Councillor Kennelly has proposed could be considered. But once this has been moved, then this would have to be lost and then an alternative motion put up is my understanding of the meeting procedures, but perhaps Richard might be able to clarify that for us. Richard, uh, you end a hand with an interpretation of the uh, meeting procedures in relation to a motion that's been put and moved and second, and an amendment that's been uh, put, 
but it is a negative to the motion that was moved and seconded. I think Councillor Dean is correct. I think the First Nation would have to be lost before this motion can be put because it's a direct negative to what uh, was put in the first instance. Would you like to just confirm that or not confirm? Uh, yeah, through you, Mr Mayor, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, right. Um, look, I agree with that interpretation. I think it's uh, Councillor Kennelly's proposed amendment was in fact 30 seconds too late. Um, so uh, I, I agree with Councillor uh, Rolak's uh, interpretation that really the motion that's on the floor uh, is the motion that it be dealt with in the confidential session of the council and therefore we would need at this time to proceed with that unless the motion is lost. Over to you. I agree with that. I think that's that's where we go. So councillors, we're all comfortable with that, where we're at in voting on this particular motion. And Councillor Canelli's motion is a fallback position if this motion is lost. So the motion is, oh, it's been moved and seconded. Yep. So the motion is down the bottom of page, whatever the page is, page eight. We've got a mover and seconder. All those in favour? Those against? Motion's carried. Yep, call the division. All those in favour of the motion uh, stand behind their seats, please. Did you stand, Councillor Zeller, or sit? <laughs> I was sitting. Sitting. <laughs> Thank you. But the motion is carried. Okay, we're moving on now to our next item, item 11. Is a boundary reform council's response to the South Australian Local Government Boundaries Commission. Um, I'm a little disappointed that the letter that I received uh, a couple of days ago, um, other elected councillors never received it from the Boundaries um, uh, Commission. Uh, you have a copy of it now. I don't know if you've had any chance to to, to go through it, but uh, it con confirms the position of the of the um, Boundaries Reform Commission in relation to the Town of Gawler's proposal. Um, there's probably, uh, uh, I'm not sure how to, to deal with this, whether we, we we refer to this particular letter that you haven't had much chance to read, or uh, we just um, paraphrase what's, yeah. what it says. Just, Mr Mayor, uh, uh, Craig Doyle has sent around a note um, this afternoon it's very brief. Um, it will take me a minute to read, so I'll just read it for completeness of the report. Um, as an addendum to the related agenda item in tonight's meeting, Council has recently received correspondence from the South Australian Local Government Boundaries Commission in response to its letter dated 24th of November 21. In brief, the Commission has advised the Town of Gawler of its view that an inquiry into the proposal would not be able to be completed prior to the 2022 local government periodic elections, and that the Commission's view that an inquiry, if it does not proceed, would therefore not commence until January 2023. And that's Craig's emphasis um, as an extract from the letter. That is, an inquiry has been deferred until after November 22 local government elections. The Commission has asked the Town of Gawler whether it would still like to receive a cost estimate in early 2022 or wait the conclusion of the November 22 elections with a response requested by 31st of January 22. So the matters with the Town of Gawler, um, the Commission is suggesting it might be prudent to wait until after the elections and then recommence the process in January 2023. However, through protocols and process, 
the Commission are giving the Town of Kuala the opportunity to make a response to that suggestion. Uh, thank you, Brian. I think you've covered that particularly well. Thank you, Craig, for uh, for that pricey. It's well well put. Any questions, councillors? Councillor? Craig? Sorry, Brian's covered it. And, but the other point, just to make briefly, was that Town of Gore would still be required to decide to um, accept the cost estimate. So it's just a, it's just a timing matter. <laughs> so the ball, as as, um, as Brian has rightly put, is in the in the um, the court of, of Gawler, with the town of Gawler. It's up to them to decide now whether they want to proceed at this stage uh, with the cost estimates from the commission. That's what you were saying there, Craig. Yeah. Yeah. So it'll be up to the town of Gawler to do that, and also up to the town of Gawler whether they uh, um, are prepared to accept the commission's uh, uh, note that they don't start to 2023, and what they could do about it if they if they wanted to. So uh, there's not much we can do, councillor, uh, councillors, but uh, I, I would um, uh, invite you to have a have a good look at this letter and have a good look at the. Uh, the letters that went in from uh, Playford, Barossa and our own council and the responses to each of the, uh, the questions raised in a, in, a, in a pricey form again by the Commission. Very interesting reading and talk as well. It, it comes as a, a second attachment to this letter. So you'll be able to go through that, the questions that we raised, which were consistent pretty much across the three councils, pretty much. And the, and the Commission's response to those. I think we're in a pretty a, a pretty good space, to be perfectly honest. You know, from, a, from my point of view, I, I believe this will just go away. But we can't uh, know that, so we've got to be vigilant and we've got to keep uh, our eye on the ball and make sure that we're, we're um, noting all of the actions that take place during this period now, which is going to be interesting indeed to see what Gawler Town of Gawler do. Questions, Councillor Dean? Um, thank you, Mayor Bill. Um, I did have an opportunity to read that thing that Craig sent around, and I was very encouraged by the fact that most of the things that we raised as things for them to actually consider and do, they considered reasonably favourably. The only one they, they said they couldn't was um, we can't uh, charge uh, the Town of Gawler for our costs because that's not in the legislation. But uh, in other things, uh, you know, the expertise and all that sort of stuff that we raised, uh, they were quite favourable about. I thought so. It was, I agree, it was quite encouraging. Thanks, Councillor Dean. Any further comments or questions, councillors? So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I just have a query. Um, so, have uh, the Commission agreed uh, to have uh, independent? Assessors, or the, yes. we, they have agreed. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they've got protocols within their their rules that, that govern all of that. Uh, that, that, that okay. Uh, all right. But no, I, I apologise. I, I mean, if I'd have realised that that letter didn't go to all the elected members, I would have emailed a copy to everyone. But I, I wasn't aware of that, so I received it, but uh, nobody else did. Uh, if there's no further questions or comments, uh, and there's no recommendation in relation to that report, we'll move on to the next matter, 11.2, which is the planning design code amendment administration costs. And uh, these are not, these are eye bulging, these costs, if you have a look at that. And uh, that's the, the new rules. And, and, uh, and I guess there's a, a lots of questions uh, surrounding that. And I have personally put a few to, to Craig and uh, uh, what I thought uh, perhaps common sense questions that uh, are hard to answer. Um, you know, what uh, what's the difference between what's happening now with this and what happened before? And what happened before these fees weren't there? That's the, the number one uh, uh, matter. So if someone's going to put a, uh, uh, a development plan amendment in or a code amendment as they're calling them now, 
they could be up for all of those fees before they start, which is not what happened before. But uh, I'll open it up for discussion or questions. Any questions or counsel councillors? Councillor Bill? Yeah, Mr. Mill, that was my, my query. Are these new fees or are these just adding increases new. on previous fees? That was a question as well. I was sort of. It's my understanding that they're, they're all new fees. So you're looking at about $32,000. So you'd want to be serious if you're going to put in any sort of code amendment of any substance. You're going to be up to $32,000 before you get very far at all under this new, new act. Uh, Craig might like to uh, support that. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bill. I think you've covered a bit. You know, they are new charges. The Legislation allows for recovery of costs. These are to cover the department's administrative costs uh, attached to code amendment proposals. Um, councillors might recall that the, the range of parties, I guess, that can uh, initiate or seek to initiate changes to the code has changed. So individual landowners, for example, can put forward proposals via the um, commission. So really what this is doing is saying that where there's a commercial uh, or the likelihood of a, an increase in commercial value and uplift, um, the Commission will charge these uh, these charges um, as administrative costs and to be aware of those. Now, uh, I might add that that doesn't um, necessarily mean there aren't other costs. So, for example, to do investigations and community engagement and the like, there's still other costs attached to a code amendment, but these are very much um, about the administrative costs that have been listed and they are new. Thank you, Craig. Um, so if the food land at Freeling put in their application now, uh, uh, how would it differ to what is happening? I just I was going to ask you, and I forgot. That's all right. Sorry, that's a good question. Look, this, these are not development application costs. These are code amendment costs. It's kind of like the old development plan amendments, the DPAs. So um, now that we're in a state, a situation of a statewide code, uh, the department is saying if you seek to amend the code, the rezoning, if you will, of your land parcel, these are costs attached to that process. So it's separate from development application based fees. Thanks, Councillor Lynn. Uh, Councillor David? Are these costs related to uh, just commercial developments or residential developments as well? Uh, potentially both, Councillor Mosley, wherever there's uplift. In the um, so I'm look, I'm saying there that if you've got a situation where land uh, Greenfields land was rezoned to be able to be developed for residential purposes, that would be seen as a commercial uplift, I believe. Oh. Um, a distinction that was used in one of the examples was that uh, they wouldn't necessarily apply in the case, for example, of uh, a council wanting to do heritage listing, where that's seen as having a community or a, a broader benefit. Okay, so that is a distinction. However, if council was to do a code amendment and there would be an uplift in value as a result, we would be liable for these costs as well. <laughs> so that's the thing to be aware of in our processing. Right. Yeah. So for a commercial business, that all be tax deductible? I'd leave that one to the accountants, and the right. Councillor Mosley. Thank, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Craig. It's interesting that we, we would be charged as well if we want to improve our property that doesn't improve the community's value. $32,000. Next matter, the COVID-19 vaccination clinic and uh, visiting Freeling. And uh, I, I must uh, commend uh, Lorinda and Pepper for a fantastic uh, initiative to get that fired up. We were under the pump. You know, we were uh, looking down the barrel at uh, being one of the lowest vaccination rates in the state. And I think... Uh, Getting 70 on the, on the one day might have lifted that a little bit. So uh, thank you for that. And it's great to see it coming back again. I thought the initiative of having the, uh, the community bus available to pick people up was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It, it, it wasn't used on this occasion, but the message is out there that, you know, that that's the community bus and it can be used for this very purpose. So uh, well done. And uh, we wait now with uh, bated breath for the 21st of December for the next one. But the, part of our reasoning, obviously, we raised this before here, was we were low on vaccination rates because we had no mobile clinics at all and very few places that people could go to to get uh, immunised. 
and no public transport to get there. So, you know, we were under the pump pretty much. But uh, thanks to this initiative, we're back up there. Any questions, councillors? If not, we move on. We come on the Visitor Information Centre Business and Marketing. And again, I absolutely commend uh, Liz and, uh, and Kyron and his team for putting this, this plan together. And uh, I think if you've had a chance to, to have a look at it, and I've only really looked at it, I haven't studied it so much, but I think it's, it's brilliant and it's giving us a real direction for the future. And it's quite exciting to think about it. It also uh, uh, is nice to, to know that we've got the opportunity to bring back our volunteers. <clears throat> I thought one of the things that uh, we, we lost uh, when the, uh, the rules changed to, to be able to display the information sign, to be accredited and so forth, was the fact that everybody there had to be a paid person, had to be professional in other words. And we lost a lot of good people and we lost a lot of credibility, I think, within our communities too that were displaying that sign. And now to be able to, to gather those, uh, those um, volunteers back in some form, not necessarily working in the centre, of course, but maybe taking tours or doing other things to, to support tourism in our towns, is fantastic. And, uh, and I think this uh, report basically caters for that within the report itself. But it's certainly giving us a roadmap for the future because tourism, when we think about it, for the next few years is probably going to be our future. Uh, we're not seeing lots of manufacturing plants you know, pop up here and there, but uh, even though we are trying. Um, but tourism, of course, we're seeing a, a real focus that with our drovers encounter, all of those things that we're, we're attempting to roll out, uh, at, it's, uh, is going to be a big part of uh, our decision making in the future. So uh, thank you, Liz and, and Kyron and, and uh, everyone who was involved in putting that together. Uh, may I uh, ask for questions? Any questions in relation to the, to the plan at all? Nothing around the table? Okay, go. I need someone to move and someone to second. Thanks, Councillor Lynn and Councillor Jason, that the reports for information be received and noted. All those in favour? Those against, that's carried. Thank you, Councillors. Now we go for the consensus reports for decision. Top of the page at the agenda and reports presented under item 12, consensus reports for decision of this ordinary meeting of the Light Regional Council held Tuesday the 14th of December be received. Would someone like to move that way? Councillor Jason, Councillor Dean, all those in favour? Those against, that's carried. Thanks, councillors. Are there any matters that you would like to uh, have removed or are there any questions to the matters that are contained in the, in the uh, Yes, I have a question. Twelve is headed consensus reports for decision. Now we have two items, item number 12.1, 12.2. Um, should these not be considered piecemeal individually? They can be, like if you withdraw them, can be uh, considered individually. Yes. I think if we, I think if we read the uh, meeting procedures handbook, mm. it specifically warns about the inadvisability of considering multiple motions for decision. Yes, and you're correct. It, it does. It doesn't say you can't do it. It doesn't recommend that you, uh, it's best practice. Well, why do um, we do it? Well, within this report that's in our Council agenda tonight, it's giving us an opportunity to not do it, Good. saying that we shouldn't do it. Mm. And that's in, in one of these reports that uh, we're about to, to uh, address. Councillor Dean? Um, Mayor Bill, I noticed that um, we've actually uh, have an amended uh, recommendation uh, well, I got that was supposed to be handed around, I think, that uh, uh, for twelve point two. So, um, sorry, for twelve point two, and uh, that would need to be withdrawn anyway. So that means effectively we'd be treating them individually, uh, which is why Councillor Kennelly wants. So um, I'll withdraw the second one anyway. If no one else has, 
lot. The second one will be withdrawn, 12.2. Our 12.1 councillors, does anyone want to withdraw that or you would be happy to adopt that motion? Can I just ask a question? I, I believe that there was to be an amended recommendation circulated um, to all members. Is that not happening? Yeah. 12.2? 12 yeah, 12.2 12 has been yeah. put on the table, I think. Oh. But 12.1 uh, has not been withdrawn at this point. Yeah, no, 12.2 is going to be withdrawn, but 12.1 hasn't been withdrawn. There's been no comment. Yep. What the cost of the final lease agreement is. Report presented Megan. Is Megan available online? Uh, I'll pass over to Richard to answer that question, Councillor Lynn. Um, yeah, thank you. Through the chair, the um, there is no change to the current uh, management fees that are provided to Dutton Park. It is just simply the lease agreement that is being um, and and the area. It's just the lease agreement. It's not the management fee. It hasn't been changed at all. Uh, that's all right. Thank you. Are there questions in relation to that, councillors? Well, I'll put recommendation two. Well, we want to then withdraw this. A recommendation two is the 12.1, but the 12.1 be, be adopted. Councillor Jason, someone like to second that? At the least, management yeah. room of Dutton Park, Councillor Dean, all those in favour, those against, that's carried. Now, policy review revision uh, 12.2 has been removed and it's open for discussion. Mr. Mayor, there's an amended um, recommendation, um, and the, the reason for that is to give management the opportunity to road test some of these adjustments with, uh, with the elected members. Uh, to ensure that it's as seamless as possible. So the only uh, the only suggested uh, variation is now revoking the informal gathering policy in the amended recommendation. So if all the councillors have a copy of the amended recommendation. And what about the councillors online? Happy to read it. We'll, we'll read the recommendation, the amended recommendation for Councillor Sam and Councillor Simon. Thanks, thanks, Brian. That Council one receives the report titled Policy Review and Revocation. Two adopts the amendments in Clause Eight of Six O Eight Code of Practice for Meeting Procedures, and three revokes Policy Six Point O Five Informal Gatherings Policy. Comfortable with that, councillors? All right, I'll open up for questions, councillors. Comments? Yes, councillor Dean. I'll move it, uh, Mayor Bill, seeing there doesn't appear to be any questions. Someone might like second that, the uh, councillor Jason. Any further questions, councillors? Not. I put the recommendation. All those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried. Councillors, it's a, a new way of doing business, I'm sure, and I'm, I'm pleased that uh, 
we're going to road test this before it's adopted in its, in its entirety. There are some matters in there that I have a little bit of concern with. And I think uh, probably written on the table, other people would have some questions too. But I think we do need to see the, uh, the final um, um, report before we make too many more comments. But uh, there's a couple of things there that, uh, although you now we're moving forward and we're trying to streamline things and whatever, there are certain things I think within the council meeting that we need to be able to understand and make sure we're not glossing over it. I think one of the uh, principal changes, though, and I agree totally with Councillor Kennelly, uh, but I was always a little bit uncomfortable with the consensus voting on the committee meetings, in particular with the, the, uh, the items in there. The whole idea, of course, to have committees is to, to make recommendations back to the council, and by and large, um, the councillors have a chance to, to read the reports and understand why the recommendations there and vote on accordingly. But we sometimes can things can go through the keeper without us knowing or you know um, understanding that. And uh, to have each of these matters come out, even if it, if they are just a, a matter of course and move in a second and adopt it, it's fine. But at least it's been drawn to the attention of every councillor and what the matter is and uh, and what the, the recommendation um, is about. So I'm. I'm pleased that we're going to be doing that in the future if this uh, new policy is adopted. Uh, a question from Richard Michael. Richard? Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, just going back to Councillor Kennelly's uh, initial comment, that is indeed one of the proposed changes to the uh, meeting procedures, is to, we're proposing that we do away with um, uh, consensus decisions and just have all decisions to be made are reported to the council and considered individually. So we'll have a report back to the January meeting uh, to flesh that out a bit more. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I think that's uh, you know, it's, it's good policy and uh, if, if uh, that's what we can do in the future, I think it's for the benefit of the council. So we look forward to the, uh, uh, the next uh, report to be tabled in January. Uh, in the meantime, I've got a move and seven, have I, for those all done? Right. Well, councillors, if there's no further questions in relation to that, we can move on. Mr. Uh, Mayor. Councillor Dean. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. We're up to 13 one councillors, and I must commend uh, Andrew Philpot. This is a brilliant report, and uh, it's really you know, uh, informing our community and doing something that's, that's uh, um, going to be of great benefit in during fire danger seasons in particular. Uh, it's as, a, as an outcome of primary fires, at least something positive can come from this. And I think your report, Andrew, is excellent. And uh, I thank you for that. And I'll open it up for questions. Yeah, Andrew, if you'd like to um, talk to your report, that'd be uh, welcomed as well. Thank you. Just a short presentation to make on this. I'll just let Stacey line it up. <laughs> uh, and Stacey, if you could turn the volume down because there's one, um, there's no, hopefully no volume because there's one very animated farmer in this scene. Who repeats a word which expresses alarm and concern if you don't need to hear in this chamber. So, all right, so Pinery Fire, look, it's, it's fresh, even though it's six and a bit years ago now, it's still pretty fresh in our memories. And it's one of those events where you kind of ask, where were you on the day of Pinery Fire? And you'll, you'll get a response. It, it really was a defining moment for this council, uh, both in the, the tragedy of it, but also in the magnificent response of the community as we, as we helped each other you know, um, recover from it. 
So the, the basic stats are there. Um, we know we lost two lives and actually and additional lives afterwards because of because of trauma and injury. 85,000 hectares of land was lost and they were magnificent crops that year. The multiple dwellings, I believe 92 primary residences were lost, many, many sheds, lots of you know, tractors, equipment, et cetera. $170 million insurance claims, the last I saw. Then there was the, the natural cost to it, the roadside vegetation, paddock trees, those sorts of things, which we're still trying with the assistance of Landscapes Board to get back. So it was a pretty tough time. So this this was just, I mean, these sort of images are no strangers to anyone who was there on the day. And what appeared, I remember working with Craig on this day, we looked at, at smoke in the distant horizon, thinking this is not going to affect us. Um, but as the day wore on, and Stacey just carry on if you like. As the day wore on, um, it became pretty apparent. And I think the next image was this one where an old farmer stood next to me in the main street as I was taking photographs and said, you realise these are people that are fleeing their farms. This is coming. You need to get prepared for this. And then it sort of, you know, personally, it really struck that, yeah, this is really on top of our, on top of our doorsteps. And so I think the next one is just a short video. If you could just play that, please, Stace. We'll play. Okay, you might just just kick it. Just hit escape maybe, and just go back to. It was triggering normally before. Just go across the main screen. It might have a, yeah, there it is. Just hit the. Okay. Well, I just draw your attention the, uh, really as part of the report I'm giving tonight is the roadside vegetation here. Now, this is pretty standard about our, our continuous cropping areas. Um, so most of our roadside vegetation is really just dry, dry grasses, weeds, those sort of things, escaping the crops and full standing vegetation really offers very little by way of any sort of protection as, as this. And you'll see surely, it's a short video, but again, you're no strangers to this. You'll see pretty, um, oops, that's all right. Just tick it off again, Jason, just perhaps just cut to the end of towards the video. Now you can see how quickly this guy has pulled across yeah, so and uh, like many people on the day have realised just how fast this fire is racing. Right. Turn the volume right down here because it's going to get this play for the mic. But um, that's the one. Anyway, yes, it's, um, it's a expression the CFS uses. So. But anyway, so it just shows you know the height of the flames, the speed of the flames. It was it, it's a, a pretty confronting sort of thing. All right. So here is our, our depot the next morning. Now, I may be able to look this up, but aluminium melts at 660.3 degrees. So just to give an indication of the sort of temperatures that roared through, and this is on Ashfield through the car park of, of Richard's depot down here. So this was just how intense this fire was at the edge of town. So I'll take you now to Pengilly Scrub. And I only certainly have a bias towards Pengilly Scrub. I've been looking after for nearly 30 years now. But again, this was an area of, of standing vegetation, but also an area which had high standing dried grasses all the way through it. And so it just shows that even, even though the wind speed was cut down um, through the scrub, it was the amount of fuel loading that really did not protect uh, Pendelli. The only two places that didn't burn were actually on the two low sand dunes under native pines where there's very little undergrowth. And they were those two areas miraculously were spared on the day. What was extraordinary was returning to the site the following day with a co-worker um, to the sound of multiple birds flitting around. So the birds had literally just lifted above and had come back down into, into the vegetation. And then the great challenge, of course, is how, how do we feed these and look after them? Thanks, Stace. And, and the incredible sort of just these smokestack trees that were still burning inside that, we, that the CFSN had to spend, uh, help them spend some days trying to put these... Um, these uh, trees out. Not everyone was, of course, so lucky. So animals that couldn't escape um, were were hit pretty bad. A farm Tali, just on the heading towards Tali, and just this one farm alone, multiple machines burnt and, and still burning in the paddocks. Again, oh, sorry. Um, 
That's right. Again, roadside vegetation there that you see the verge. Sorry, guys, I'm completely obsessed with roadside vegetation. I spend much of my life looking at it. So again, it was just dry standing grasses. So it, it burnt down to mineral earth. It was just, a, just an ashen bed. Thanks, Stacey. And again, not an uncommon sight of large trees. Uh, this was days after the event that are still well on fire and a pretty challenging thing for the CFS to have to head around and try and put all these spots out. This is about February the following year uh, because the fire was in just at the start of summer. And so we had, a, as we all recall, a pretty horrendous um, summer of just soil storms as a soil was shifting madly around the place. And farmers, to their credit, took some amazing ways to cultivate their properties and different ways to try and slow that wind erosion down. Um, now, this is where it gets interesting. So this is just in the aftermath of Pinery. This is down Mitchell Road near, near Pengilly, just south of Wasleys. So I was driving around the, the fire ground days after just looking at unusual circumstances. This one really caught my attention in that the fire here had burnt to the fence line and yet we have dry standing grass unburnt almost on the fence line itself and within native vegetation. So the premise was this vegetation had stopped the wind speed effectively enough to just to lift, take the fire out. I think the next one too, please, Stacey. So again, same road, looking down towards Malloy Road on the right-hand side. Some of that vegetation had burnt and scorched, but it wasn't, it wasn't destroyed. Um, and again, it's, it's a theory of fire intensity as relates to the wind speed. This vegetation had just taken the wind speed out in this, in this local microenvironment, allowing this vegetation to, um, to survive. Now, so this is our, for our continuous cropping areas, which is much of our land, particularly if you take a line from wool sheds across to Freeling and then head north, Pinkerton Plains, Magdala, those sort of areas uh, towards Hamley Bridge. These are pretty standard sort of roadside views you'll, you'll get this time of the year. High standing dried grasses as you drive around. Um, and again, a pioneer sort of event that's going to go up um, like a tinderbox. You've got a, a small substation on the right hand side, which is part of Freeling's power supply. This is one of these sites I'm proposing to do this trial of, of kinopod and low fire fuel uh, vegetation. So the next one, please. This one I just want to pull up. This is a really concerning development which relates to fire. Um, a lot of farmers now are turning to using our road verges for two reasons, fire security measures in that they're spraying from the road edge to the crop edge. So we're losing enormous amounts of biodiversity. And this is being actually promoted by agronomists, I'm finding out through the back doors. So there are some local people in the district that are saying to farmers, this is best practice. It is probably not best practice, I would argue. So one is biosecurity. I've had a contractor look at weed, the weed loading against the crop with that type of treatment no treatment and minimal treatment and there is zero difference in terms of weed loading so it's kind of a fallacy that's growing legs that i think we need to find a way to counter the other is fire management of course yes you could argue that's a much lower fuel intensity of course but again in a pinery situation it won't take much for, for a, a fire burning across the screen to jump that road if there's nothing to, nothing to block it uh, and to carry on i think pinery you probably had wind spotting you know, or ember spotting 100 metres in front of the fire front. As you're probably aware, this is Grey Street in the lead up into Freeling from the Teeley Highway. Now, this is planted up part of COSI from South Aussie's funding some years ago. Um, uh, COSI's vision was actually jacarandas right throughout. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> we did actually plant a whole bunch of jacarandas on this road, and the jacarandas did receive exactly the same treatment. I didn't spray them with herbicide, I actually promise you. <laughs> um, they received exactly the same treatment, but they have not they have not survived as I thought they wouldn't because they've just not cut out for for the intensity or the variations of our climate. In a town, they do very well, and certainly Wasley's at the moment is beautiful. Gaul is quite beautiful with them, etc. They didn't work here. What did work beautifully um, was the kinopod. So this is this is what I'm proposing these areas you'd have street or roadscapes probably a lot better than that that's that's a bit weedy and probably you know needs a bit of attention so we'd be looking at a whole range of those type of salt bush blue bush species um, that would provide something of be very careful here nothing stops pinery you know if you're in, you're in its way you're going to come into harm but it might provide a refuge or a place of a safer existence versus the last slide so when it's just high high grasses. So just, just to 
finish, and thank you very much for your time. Fire intensity we know relates to wind speed, relates to fuel loading and to fuel arrangement. So high standing grasses are as good as it gets for a fire. That's exactly what it wants. So standing vegetation, exotic or native, can reduce wind speed. We know that. And so careful species selection, this is what I'm on about, um, could just help us improve resilience. It's not a silver bullet. It's not, it's not a, a magic thing, but it may just be another little part of our armory to help us going forward. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks very much, Andrew. That was great. And I'm, I'm sure those res those images resonated with a few of us here and brought back some very frightening memories of that particular day. It was a very nasty. But thanks, uh, Andrew, for your for your report. I think it's it's powerful and it's giving us a, a, a way forward and, and something that, that maybe our prevention measures for anything of similar nature that could happen in the future. Particularly now heading into a fire danger season as well. It's it's very timely. So thank you, Andrew. Worthy. I'm in discussions with CFS currently and some senior people from the Department of Environment and Water in their fire ecology department. So thanks to Brand for uh, that introduction. That's been most useful. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, <coughs> I'd like to make some brief comments about bush fires. Certainly. Now, in, during the 1960s, uh, a bushfire went through my property and we weren't there at the time, but the trees showed ample evidence of it. That was, that was probably 1965 to 1968, that fire. The next fire was in 2005, and I had made some rough preparations that the fire got into our property. Uh, burnt crops threatened the house, and certainly we learnt some hard lessons from it. The next fire, we have 68, say 2005, the next one was the Pinery Fire in mm. 2015. Now, by that time, we had controlled high grasses on roadside verges. And I think that was largely the reason that we survived and the fire didn't enter our place. And I'm very concerned that we do something about um, high grass on the sides of roads, uh, grass that wild oats that grow up to head height, uh, other things, wild turnip and stuff in there too. Now, I have discovered that judicious spraying with glyphosate when the grasses are small can combat the problem. And uh, I know you're uh, in favour of chenopods. Uh, it's a wonderful idea, but practically speaking, our council rural roads have, where the grasses aren't controlled, are in effect fire wicks. And two things, I would urge that um, these grasses are, uh, are controlled by spraying at a suitable time. Um, there's another tactic that in paddocks where you're going to crop, you can spray within the fence and spray outwards into the road reserve. This has been done to uh, discourage livestock from wanting to graze through fences. We found that that was a good tactic. Uh, the other thing I'd mention, and I'll bring this up at infrastructure, is that we, as a council, could, instead of slashing, resort to spraying. Now, there are, there are mounds and uh, things on the edges of our roads that just don't lend themselves to slashing, and slashing is expensive. Uh, 
a four-wheel drive utility with a spray unit on the back can uh, do that work very much easier. And I don't know if there would need to be two people in the in the utility, but there's only one driver in a in a tractor slashing. But I think we've got to do something about the the fire problem. We've had an enormous scare with well, worse than a scare, a disaster, a calamity with 2015 Pinery, and many people aren't over it yet. And I think that um, it's certainly your your proposal to use Chenopods is a positive one, but I think it's only a partial one and it can only have limited practicality, whereas um, I think cutting down the, the fire wicks along roads would be a very, very positive move. Thanks so much, Councillor Peter. Councillor Jason? <clears throat> Just a, a couple of queries. Um, obviously, saltbush has been proven to be a pretty good fire break, but um, speed of growth, I mean, having, having grown some at home, it seems to grow excessively slowly. Um, so is it something that we could be looking at 10 years before we saw any benefit from it? Uh, do we have any clue as to how long something like this would actually take? Uh, through the chair. Uh, no, you're right. As some situations, and there's probably about 20 species of kinopod in the, in this mix. So some are faster growing than others. So the site you saw on Gray Street just was 2017. I think Rich, that was, um, yeah, 2017. That was planted in about, I think, July 1, in fact. We had um, volunteers come across to do that. So that's, what, four years old. And that, that got to a reasonable height um, in about two years. And that's probably in a fairly dry time. 2016 and 2020 was a pretty dry time. So I'm reasonably confident that some of those species are reasonably fast growing. The, the secret is, is, of course, like any, any horticultural endeavour, is good, good preparation and a bit of luck that you get reasonable rainfalls at the right time to, um, to get those things moving along. But no, I think some of those species can be actually are quite quick at, at shooting. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Andrew. Just a question. Quick question uh, of Andrew. Do you need a, uh, a high density of planting, otherwise you'll get the tall grasses growing in between? Uh, it's exactly that. Um, um, it is, look, the road verge is one of the most challenging spaces to manage, of course, and, and what Councillor Peter says is absolutely correct. Um, and the, and the, the rub is that our roadside vegetation is the last examples of native vegetation in these in these districts. So. So the great balance between protection, fire control, nurturing, looking after, et cetera, is, is, is a, a great juggling act. But you're right, Councillor Dean, if the, if the preparation and the planting is done well, um, you can achieve almost 100% cover. Now, the danger is going to be spray drift because they are susceptible to herbicides. So that, that zone inside, and Peter's point about grazing and sheep pushing through the fence, we have to think about all those sort of things. So, as always, the devil's in the detail here, but good design and good implementation will save us a lot of heartache uh, long term. And this, if I may, Mayor, look, this is just an experimental process. It, it's really an extension of the safer uh, fire-friendly gardens that we're seeing the CFS promote and others promote. So it's really an extension of the broader landscape. We have a thousand kilometres of rural road. This will cover six. So that leaves 994 kilometres of other ideas and um, yeah we're all trying to work on that one thank you thank you andrew and jason um just going on from that um the other question i've got is obviously you did touch on it with farmers obviously spraying um there's obviously a fair outlay 10 grand a year on planting um if they're going to be spraying are they going to then wipe out what you're putting in um and are obviously the farmers then going to be liable for replacement is is a how do we stand with that? Obviously, if they're going to come in and go, well, we think it should all be clear and wipe out everything you put in. It's a bit of a waste, wasted endeavour. 
Excellent for the mayor. Excellent point. So tonight is really to get the blessing of the chamber to go ahead with the application, and it's and I'm sort of plugging through it. So if we are successful, uh, if we are successful, and it's going to be a very, I imagine, a fairly competitive uh, process around Australia, um, the next major stage will be consultation of those adjoining landholders. Now, if it comes to pass that one or more of those landholders are absolutely dead against it, we'll just shift the locations and we'll find landholders that are, are more interested in that experimental approach. Um, farming's a very broad church, is my experience of working in this region for 30 years now. So some will be accepting, some will be very sus suspicious maybe or un unaccepting of it. Um, and I think some will be quite welcoming of it. CFS are really interested because no one has the data uh, and senior department people, the fire ecologists say, we don't, don't have the data. So they're really interested in what we're doing. So it is it really, it's cutting, sort of breaking ground stuff in this one. So I think farmers would have a right to be, you know, I guess questioning of it, but we have a lot of country. We can move around to find a combination where uh, one is the farming family is is supportive and prepared to work in, um, and it, and we just yeah all those sort of things. So I think there's scope for manoeuvring there. Yeah, thank, thank you, Andrew. Qu question. Oh, thank you, Councillor Lynn. Someone like to second the recommendation, Councillor Jason. All those in favour. Those against. That's carried. Thank you, Councillors, and thanks so much, Andrew, for. A, it's a very informative report. <laughs> uh, we're moving on now to our uh, council office, council chamber live meeting streaming 13.2. Comments or questions, councillors? I, I have some comments. Councillor Simon? Um, yes, I, I have a few questions. Um, and first, I have to say, for some reason, I'm just working off my iPad. So once if I switch to the agenda, which I have to do to read some comments, my face will disappear. But that shouldn't be a problem, I hope. So, so my question is. So, so I actually went and, and read through all these um, um, sections, the section 302B um, and the uh, uh, notice number five and the not notice number one. What what I have um, found, and which is, is quite obvious, is that the section 302B deals with public health emergency. Notice number one and the previous notice number one is only concerned with the legalities of conducting meetings electronically. At no point does it talk about the recording of meetings or the keeping of such recordings. So what I don't understand is why we seem to be conflating two different issues and acting as one has anything to do with the other. So independent of having a public health emergency or not, independent of having people participating in and following council meetings electronically or not, we can and should record these meetings and keep them accessible for the public indefinitely. So. According to our June resolution, we were going to have a trial and have staff regularly review the audio and visual quality and remedy it if necessary. Since we have not heard anything negative about those recordings, and I did ask at our October um, meeting, I must assume and actually know that the quality is fine. So I do not see any reason anymore why we need to delay this any longer and why we, instead of actively deleting those recordings, just leave them on our YouTube channel for good. So, so I'm, I'm absolutely against this motion. I, I don't see any reason why we need to prolong this trial. In my opinion, the trial was about seeing if our recordings meet a certain standard. We had our um, dedicated staff looking at those and they have not told us that there's anything wrong with it. So we have to assume those recordings are good. I've checked them myself. They are fine. So therefore we could just move on. This whole business about, you know, know this number five and know this number one, everything like that has literally nothing to do with the fact that we can record these meetings and that we should record these meetings and we can leave them on our YouTube channel indefinitely. So I still don't understand why we conflating these two things. So I'm, I'm absolutely against this motion. Thank you, Councillor Simon. Further questions or comments? I couldn't understand.
councillors, I have uh, a series of recommendations on page 31. Would someone like to move that way? Just a query, Mr Mayor, is Simon, are you, are you going to move a, a counter a motion or are you not? You're standing aside. No. Yes, I, I do. I, I'm, um... I do have a, a motion without notice prepared, or I can do a kind of motion now, or whatever, because, yeah, I don't think we should just move to keep these recordings and record these meetings as we do, keep them as we do, and that's just what we should be doing. Yes. Um, one thing that happened from uh, when we passed that original motion and now is the that in our uh, councillor elected member training that we had at Hewitt, um, Satish Dasan spoke quite strongly and gave quite a number of reasons why uh, he advised against us putting our uh, council meeting permanently on YouTube. For that reason, I'm actually opposed to having it on there at all. Um, however, I see this motion as we've got now is a reasonable compromise between the, my view and Councillor Simon's view. Um, and given that this council is almost over, only a few more months to run, it makes perfect sense to me to uh, leave it to a new council to make their decision. So that's why I'm generally, whilst not enthusiastic about this motion, I'm happy to uh, vote in favour of it because it's a compromise between uh, what I'd like to see happen and what Council Simon would like to see happen, and it, it leaves the decision to a new council, which I think uh, would be um, not a bad idea. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Dean. Councillor David? I'm in favour of what uh, Councillor Zeller said. We've already passed the motion that we're going to adopt this practice, so I don't see why we just keep on dragging it on, dragging it on. We have got another 12 months to run for this council before we go to the election. Is that correct? No, it's caretaker mode comes in. Well, we made the decision a few months ago to, to progress this matter. Now we seem to be stalling on it. So I would no, vote the council says out. that we were to review it now. That's what we're doing. We're reviewing it as per the original recommendation. It was there for 12 months. Richard, you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just two points. Uh, the first point is uh, in relation to uh, notice number one. That gave the council the ability to hold their meetings electronically. So that's why there's a link. Okay. The second point I'd like to make is that the recommendation is just that a recommendation. So if the if the council are of the mind that there ought to be a different resolution, uh, an alternative recommendation put to the council for vote, then the council is entirely able to do that. You don't have to adopt the recommendation as printed. It's just the report writer's recommendation to the council to consider if that doesn't sound double dutch so <laughs> no. you're quite you're quite able to put something else up for the vote thank you yeah thanks richard that that makes a lot of sense we get it council i agree with councillor zeller and in fact i would second his um alternative yeah can you tell us what the motion was Yes, if, if I may, I haven't actually um, set that motion, but I can read it for you. So the, the plan was to move. That council notes the success of the six month trial period for the recording of monthly and special council meetings. The council notes that the audio and visual quality of set recordings is satisfactory. And that council resolves to keep those recordings available on council's YouTube channel indefinitely. 
So th this is this is the motion that I would like to move. And then if I can make some comments, the first one again, if even if we were not be able, even if notice number one wouldn't have happened, and we were not able to have to participate in council meetings electronically, we could still record those meetings and keep them indefinitely, those recordings. We could still do that. That has nothing to do with the change, uh, with the declaration of an, a public health emergency through Notice 302B by the state government. It has nothing to do with that. In fact, there has been many councils that have recorded their meetings prior to the declaration of a health emergency in this state and in other states in Australia. It literally has nothing to do with each other. That's my first point. The second point, talking about, oh, we, this council is almost finished. Quite the opposite. Now is the really, really important part of this council because we're coming up to an election. People get more interested in what we are doing. People might want to stand. People might want to challenge us. So it is more important than ever to be transparent, to be cooperative with the community, to show them what we're doing. And, and to be accountable for our actions, for what we say, what we do, what we vote for, what we stand for, all those things are more important right now than ever. So to, to leave those recordings publicly available for everybody that's in, that is interested is just super important. And if I can make one more point, the statistics showed that we had on average, that is on average, 11 people watching these meetings. Every single one was an 11 extra people watching these meetings. I'm sure you guys all remember the time when, when we had a special meeting and all these farmers were in our chamber and, and it was a totally different atmosphere in the chamber. Those were just about 11 extra people in our chamber. So imagine that is what happened every single time now since we had the chance that people could watch our meeting. So I think that's a huge difference to the functioning of our council and to the transparency on, and to the ability of us to work as a perf as a representatives of our um, constituents out of our ratepayers, and that is our job. So I think it's crucial that we record these meetings, that we are transparent, and that we leave those meetings on YouTube indefinitely. Thanks, Councillor Zaba. Any further comments, Councillors? Uh, do we have a second that? Uh, Councillor Peter seconded that motion. Can I um, just raise a question, if I may? Councillor Sam? Um, I am in support of the amendment motion in principle. The only thing I'd be concerned about is the word indefinitely and how that aligns with the Records Management Act. Um, and I'd probably just say that we would keep the recordings the same tenure that we keep physical copies of the council meeting. So if that is a period of seven years, I'm not sure, but that would be the only thing that I would be unsure about. I would probably um, consider amending is just a word indefinitely to in line with the Records Management Act 1997. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I'm concerned about that too. And I was actually going to move an amendment to that motion that the storage uh, of the YouTube's be reviewed at the end of this this uh, 12 month period, and so we we can actually have a review of that that storage. That would be my amendment to that motion. Yeah, I'll second that with the removal of the word indefinitely. Yeah. If I may, I think that is a good point to to change that indefinitely. That is a that's a very uh, strong word. So yeah, whatever the council feels more comfortable with, I'm I'm in favour of that. Okay. Yep. You're 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 comfortable that we keep the the, the record of these of the meetings uh, uh, in in line with the hard copies that are kept record management uh, uh, procedures. Absolutely. And Councillor Bill uh, recommended that the policy be reviewed in in 12 months' time. That's changed what you 
is uh, recommended. I think if you can add that as a fourth point, I'm absolutely for that as well. Would you accept that? I absolutely would. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, that's the storage to be reviewed in 12 months. The storage that, of the record. That's the storage aspect of your, your amendment. Be reviewed in 12 months. Yes, yes, I understand that. That sounds good. Yeah. So, I yeah. seconded it. What did you say? I seconded the removal of the word indefinitely right. and the storage of it uh, to be reviewed in 12 months. Right. Okay. Right? I'm still dealing with the motion that Councillor Zella has put to the meeting. Uh, yeah. Mr. Mayor, if I can ask a question for clarification for the minute taker. <laughs> Candy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Councillor Zeller, from my my understanding, has uh, proposed a three part recommendation, uh, which in uh, short uh, asks the council to note that the trial is a success that the AV is satisfactory and that uh, the council keeps recording and then uh, added the words for an indefinite period of time. The amendment, as I understand it, although I take the view that Councillor Zeller has agreed to include the words of the amendment in his third part, is that the word indefinite is replaced by uh, a review of the practice to occur at the conclusion of a 12 month period. Is that interpretation correct? Yeah. Um, no, if I may, no, I think that the, the, in the third part, the, the word indefinitely be removed, and as Councillor Mitchell said, be put with in line with our records keeping policy or however that is, right. is worded. And then in a fourth um, point be added saying that we review review the, the, the time of storage or the, the storage, you know, that sort of thing in 12 months time. Or we can review the whole policy, the whole thing in 12 months time, whatever people are comfortable with. But, but I think that's how the way it was meant to be. Yep. So we review the practice uh, in line with our records keeping management policy in 12 months. In storage for 12 months. That sounds good. Probably need it. <laughs> it's a good thing this is being recorded, Mr. Mayor, isn't it? Oh, I couldn't say. It's, it's, getting, it's getting difficult. Just, just, just to confirm what um, our general manager, um, Richard, um, clarified. Firstly, note the success of the trial. Note the quality of the AV being satisfactorily. Keep recordings on Council's YouTube in accordance with the Records Management Act. And review the storage position in 12 months. Yeah. That's the motion. That's the motion in front of us at the moment. Yes. We have a mover in Council Yep. And we have a second in Council Are you happy with that motion? So that's the motion that's in front of us at the moment, councillors. Would you like us to read it out again? Oh, yeah. Otherwise? <laughs> you... <laughs> well, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Those against? The motion is carried. Are you comfortable with that, councillors, that we will review that in 12 months time? And the practice of the YouTube will continue as per what's happening at the moment. Our 13.3 annual business plan, a November 21 review. Uh, thank you, Richard, for that. It's uh, an excellent uh, report and giving us a, a good understanding of where we're up to with many of our, our projects and, 
and, and Council Matters, would anyone like to comment? If not, there's a recommendation three quarters of down the page 35. The Light Regional Council receives the report title. Oh. Okay. All right. Move Councillor Bill, and like second Councillor Jason. All those in favour? Those against, that's carried. Yeah. I get out of stride. <laughs> uh, 13.4 application for discretionary general rate rebate recommendation on page 37, councillors. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I have uh, I have a conflict of interest by association, so I will leave for this. Certainly. Councillors, are there any questions or comments? If not, I'll put the recommendation halfway down page 37. Someone like to move that way? Councillor Jason, someone like to second that? Councillor David, all those in favour? Those against? And that's code. Thank you, Councillor. <laughs> Thanks for that report, uh, Richard. It was uh, very comprehensive and gave us uh, no room for error. We're moving to our procedural matters. Questions on notice? We don't have any questions on notice. Questions without notice? Have none of those at the moment. Motion on notice? We have none of those at the moment. And motions without notice? We have nil. Councillors, we move now into our confidential section of our council meeting. And I'd like someone to move that we do just that under section 92 and 3 of the Local Government Act. Councillor Jason, Councillor Sharon, all those in favour?